thanks for checking out this video. In this video, I'm gonna be taking these seven segment electromechanical displays and turning them into a YouTube channel subscriber count. Subscriber count YouTube subscriber channel. It's gonna display how many people are subscribed to my YouTube channel. There are three reasons why I like these displays. The first reason is that I just like how they look. These are the kind of displays that you would find in an old gas pump, or maybe I think some train stations still use them, but I just think that they look pretty cool. The second reason that I like them is that when you're changing the segments, they make a really satisfying clicking sound. And the third is that once they've been set, you don't need any power to maintain state. These displays work by using electromagnets that can flip each segment depending on the orientation of the magnetic field. In order to change the orientation of the magnetic field, you need to figure out a way to change the direction of current going through the coil. In other words, flipping the polarity of the voltage applied across the coil. So now the question becomes, how can we programmatically flip the polarity of a voltage across a load? One common answer to this problem is to do so by using an H-bridge. An H-bridge consists of four switches, which are usually MOSFETs. These MOSFETs are arranged in such a way that when only MOSFETs 1 and 4 are turned on, current will flow from left to right through the load, indicated in purple. And when MOSFETs 2 and 3 only are turned on, current will flow from right to left through the load, indicated in yellow. This is great, but 4 MOSFETs per segment means that we'll need a total of 28 transistors per display. And given that I want 6 displays, this is going to take a lot of transistors. Let's try something else. What if we tie one terminal from each segment's coil together as a common? We could then set this to plus 12 volts or to ground, and then individually switch the other side of each coil. This now requires 8 H-bridges instead of 7, but the advantage now is that A through G can be shared among other 7 segment displays within an array of displays. It should be noted that there is a third state to an H-bridge, and that is that the load is not connected. Because MOSFETs can be open, the common line can be used to multiplex through each display. In the end, this allows us to use 13 H-bridges to control 6 displays as opposed to 42. That's a savings of 116 transistors. The saving comes at the expense of only being able to control one display at a time, and each display must be set in two steps, flipping blacks to whites and then whites to blacks. For the display driver, I'll be using Freescale's MC33880 configurable octal serial switch that is controlled using SPI. It can be configured as a high side switch, a low side switch, or as an H bridge, which is the configuration that I'll be using in this project. I couldn't find any breakout boards for these 32 pin wide SOICs, so I'll be milling my own. I love the other mill CNC machine, however, I don't think I'll ever get a return on investment, but it sure is a lot of fun to mill things. I've had this mill for over two years now, and it still cuts six mil trace in space pretty well. Time to solder up these breakout boards and get them onto a breadboard. Here's a cool trick for wiring up breadboards quickly. I wrote some code to prove out that this scheme will work. Because I only have two display drivers to handle segments A through G, I'm using my hand to change the common connection between positive 12 volts and zero volts. Seems like this scheme will work. Let's turn it into a PCB. I've already done the schematic entry and component placement. All that's left to do now is route. The routing is now complete. I ended up using four layers for this board. Now all that's left to do is flood the polygon pores, do one more design rule check, and generate the Gerber files. I'll zip up all the Gerbers, upload them to Fab, and then wait for a box to appear on my porch. Nice.
Using stencils to apply solder paste is definitely the way to go, considering how cheap it is to have a stencil made today. I'm using 6337 leaded solder paste. Make sure to be liberal with the solder paste, as you will ideally have enough to cover every pad with one squeegee swipe. You can buy fancy squeegees for this part, but instead I'm just going to use my driver's license. And unfortunately, it's going to take a few swipes to cover every pad. Let's remove the stencil and see how it turned out. Not perfect, but I'm ready to do some touch up with the soldering iron if needed. When placing components on the board, it's important to get their alignment down as best as you can. But don't worry, as long as you're 95% of the way there, the surface tension of the liquid solder will usually take over and allow the part to align itself. Now that the board is populated, we can move it into the reflow oven. After a bit of hand soldering, the board is finished. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Let's write some code for it. Before getting into it, I created a spreadsheet to help generate hexadecimal values that represent which bits must be sent to the display drivers, such that they can create digits 0 through 9. Once this was done, I built up some functions that abstracted the lower levels away, allowing me to create a single function call to send any value to the display. I wrote a quick counter demo to test things out, and... It seems that some of the displays are having an influence on each other. The first step is to figure out if this is a hardware or a software issue. A good place to start is with a logic analyzer to see if we are physically getting the output that we would expect. After looking through the data capture, it seems that the software is doing exactly what it should be. This means that the issue is likely within the hardware. After drawing out a few scenarios on paper, it became apparent that the issue was due to the fact that the coils that drive the displays have a very low impedance at DC. This allowed for unintentional pathways for current to flow, which is why other displays were being affected when attempting to control just one. The only way I can see to prevent this from happening is by adding series connected diode arrays between the high and low side of each display's common connection to the driver. Since each of the six displays has seven segments, I'll need to add 42 of these diode arrays. Let's try this again. There, that should do the trick. Okay, that's much better. Notice that the display driver algorithm is only flipping the segments required to transition to the next number, retaining reusable segments from the previous state. Let's continue writing code. To start off, I'm going to be bringing up a serial port and Wi-Fi, leveraging the Arduino libraries. This Wi-Fi setup code here can be found online, and it seems to be pretty standard for ESP32 projects. The next step is to build up a way to make HTTP GET requests to a web server, and then take that data and store it in a buffer which can later be parsed. In this case, I'm using a character array of length 4096. I chose 4096 arbitrarily because I'm not really sure how much data I'm going to get back from this request, but I figure it's a good place to start. The next step is to make sure that there's an active Wi-Fi connection before making an attempt to connect with a web server. This can be done by checking the return value of the Wi-Fi status function. If a Wi-Fi connection is active, then I'll go on to make a request. I'll be using the Google API to ask for data about my YouTube channel, and in particular, the subscriber count value. It's pretty straightforward to generate this URL from Google API. Next, I will be issuing the GET request to the above URL and check its return value to determine if it was successful or not. HTTP 200 is the response code that indicates success, so we will check for that before moving forward and then handle the case where the request is not successful. For now, I'll use Arduino's string class to store the return characters as a string data type and print them out to the serial port. Later, I'll be converting this string into a character array so that it's easier to handle when parsing. Using PuTTY, I'm able to view the serial data coming back from the ESP32 and check if the information that I'm after is present in the payload. Hey, there it is. Now the trick is to write a function that extracts these characters within the subscriber count field and convert them into an integer data type that can be used by the rest of my program. Before writing a function to handle this, 
I need to get rid of the serial port output and convert the string data type into a character array. The general idea for this parser is that a loop will iterate through each character within the payload array, checking to see if a sequence of characters matches a predetermined sequence. In this case, the sequence I'm going to be looking for is SUB, because this is indication enough that the actual subscriber count value is somewhere nearby. The argument to this function will be a pointer to the beginning of the data collected from the HTTP GET request, and the function will return an integer. To iterate through the array, I will be using a while loop that will continue to search until either the predetermined sequence of SUB is found, or it reaches the null character indicating that it's at the end of the array. I realize that this many nested ifs is bad practice. Let me know in the comments if there's a better way of doing this. If the character sequence is found within the array, it's then just a matter of applying a known offset to get to the index where the actual subscriber count begins. In this case, an offset of 19 characters from the character S in subscriber count will get us to the starting index. Next, we'll need to use the closing double quote as a delimiter to know when we've reached the end of the subscriber count value. Since the subscriber count value can vary in length, we can't use a fixed offset. Within another while loop, the indexing variable J will be used to keep track of how many characters are between the double quotes. Now that the position of the delimiter is known, we can find the value's ending index by adding the variable j-1 to the beginning index. So now we have all the information we need to pull the subscriber count value out of the rest of the data. We will move these characters into their own buffer and then break from the while loop to end the search. Next, I'll be converting these characters into an integer data type using the a to i function. I realize that a to i is obsolete and doesn't really do any error handling but my use case is simple enough and I'm not worried about going over the top with error handling at this point. Lastly, the function will return this value as an integer. Going back to the git request, I'll call the function that I just wrote and store the value in a local variable. This value will then get sent to the display by passing it to a function that I built called int to display. Once the value is sent, the ESP32 will hang for 5 minutes and then the process will repeat. One last step to make this code a little more robust is to only update the display if the subscriber count value has changed. In order to do this, I'll create another variable called previous subscribers to store the previous count. This way, when a new count is obtained, it can be compared to the old count and only update the display if they are not equivalent. That should do it. Let's upload the code and see if it works. Awesome, seems to be working. So there it is, I'm calling this project complete. I had a ton of fun making this project and I learned a few things along the way. I look forward to seeing the display in action as I'm hanging out in my lab. Thanks again for checking out this video and making it to the end. I'll see you in the next project.